Hooke's law tells us that the stress is proportional to strain, but you can only use this within the elastic limit. So the natural question now is, what happens when we go beyond the elastic limit? I mean, we know the proportionality won't work anymore, but what happens to the material? And that's what we're going to explore in this video. And so before we do that, if you require some refresher on Hooke's law and stress and strain, then we've talked a lot about this in previous videos. So it would be a great idea to go up and watch those videos first and then come back over here. All right, so we're gonna explore the regions beyond the elastic limit. And the best way to do that is by drawing a graph. So over the y-axis, we're gonna plot the stress and over the x-axis, we're gonna plot the strain. And the, the shape of this graph really depends on two things. It depends on which material we're dealing with, and it also depends on what kind of stress that we're dealing with. We've seen that there are a couple of ways you can stress the material. You can do tensile or you can do compressive. There are other ways as well. So for the sake of this video, we're gonna, we're gonna focus on steel. That's the material we're focusing on. And the kind of stress we'll be talking about is tensile stress, which means you can imagine that we're pulling on this, so to create tension. And um, the experiment that we should have in our head is somewhat like this. So we'll first pull, and as, as the material elongates, there will be a restoring force generated. And if you calculate that restoring force divided by the area, the cross-sectional area, that'll be the stress. But but when the material comes to equilibrium, I mean, it'll eventually come to equilibrium, right? When it does, the pull will be equal to the restoring force, right? And so to calculate the stress, we can just take the pulling force and divide by the area. And then we'll calculate the elongation divided by the original length, that'll give us a strain. And once we do that, we can plot. After that, we'll increase our pull, the material will strain more, and we'll repeat the experiment over and over again, and we would have plotted this entire graph, all right? So if you do that, and today we have machines to do that, I mean, you may be wondering, how do we do that? So we have machines today to do that for us. And so if we do all of this, then the graph that comes out for steel would look somewhat like this. Now this graph looks a little bit scary, but don't worry, we're gonna explore this step by step. The first thing is how to look at this graph. Whenever you see this graph, and we are at a, any particular point, what you have to understand is this will be the amount of strain generated and this will be the amount of stress. So for example, if I say, okay, let's concentrate on this point, we are over here, it means this much is the strain and this is the stress, all right? Okay, now, the first thing you can note is that there is this straight line there is a linear region. And this is the region where Hooke's law is working because in Hooke's law, when Hooke's law works, sigma uh, stress is proportional to strain and proportionality means straight line, all right? But the straight line ends after some point over here. So we could mark that point, we could look at that region. And let me call that point as point A. And we could say now, beyond point A, no longer it's a straight line, which means Hooke's law no longer works. So point A marks the Hooke's law limit. So we are over here now on the graph. So what do you think will happen if we go beyond this point A, if we increase the strain even more? Well, you we might think, okay, now we'll have permanent deformation, right? Well, it turns out, no. It turns out that even beyond this point A, we are still within the elastic regions. Turns out that there's another point somewhere over here point B, and that's where the elastic limit comes in. So point B is the elastic limit, elastic limit. It's also sometimes called as the yield point, yield point. So between A and B, Hooke's law no longer works, but we are still within elastic regions. That means if we were to, if we were to strain up till this point over here, and if we were to let go of that deforming force, the material will snap back. But once you go beyond the elastic limit, I mean, imagine you strain it so much. Let's say you strain it so much, and, and I should have drawn this a little bit longer, but anyways, suppose you strain it so much, and now if you let go of the deforming force, now the material will not snap back to its original length. There will be some permanent deformation left over here. So imagine over here, look at the steel, imagine this is where we are right now, this is the amount of strain that we have right now. And if we let go of that deforming force, the material will not snap back to its original length. 
Now there will be some permanent deformation going on, so some permanent deformation left over here. So once you go beyond point B, you have permanently deformed it at least a little bit. Now if you look at this region, this is a really interesting region because notice as we move our pointer along over here, along this point, notice that the stress is pretty much a constant. It's not changing. Stress is pretty much a constant, but look at the strain. The strain is increasing like anything, all right? Which means we're keeping our pull pretty much the same, but our material keeps on elongating, keeps on elongating. This region, where the stress is pretty much a constant but the strain keeps increasing is called as the plastic flow region because it's it's behaving like a liquid. It's sort of like flowing because the stress is pretty much a constant over here. The topmost point of this graph, the, the highest stress that we can get, we'll call it as C, and this point is called the ultimate, ultimate tensile strength. Ultimate tensile strength. It's called ultimate because this is the maximum stress your material can handle without getting seriously damaged. So if you don't want to damage your material, don't go beyond this point. But this is just a test material. We don't care what happens to it. We want to go beyond this point and see what happens. Well, if we go beyond this point, we're gonna damage our material. But notice something funny happens. Notice that the graph is curving down. That means the stress is actually decreasing, yet the strain keeps increasing. I mean, what's going on? I mean, we're, we, we can, we're decreasing the pull, and yet the strain is increasing. And so for quite some time, I was not sure what was going on over here. So I went to my mechanical engineer friend who has actually conducted this experiment in his lab. And I asked him like, how is it that when you go beyond this point, when you decrease the stress, the strain keeps increasing? I mean, what's going on? And so he explained to me that what's really happening beyond this point is that, so imagine, so imagine we are over here, let's say, we're over here. So imagine we are over here right now. Let's say this is the ultimate tensile strength. And if we go beyond this point, what really happens is that there will be a small neck that is get, that gets developed over here. Your material will start pinching like this. And you may have seen this in rubber band when you stretch it too much. And once the material pinches, the cross-sectional area over here decreases. And so if you calculate the stress in that region, the stress is actually increasing. Even though you decrease the pull, the stress in that region is increasing because of the smaller cross-sectional area. But when we calculate the stress over here, we always do that force per this cross-sectional area, right? Because we don't know what this is. And so once the pinching starts, the stress in this region is increasing. And from this point onwards, all the strain will be localized in this region. Only this part will undergo strain. And so even after decreasing the pull, even if you decrease the overall stress, the stress in this region keeps increasing. And as the material elongates, you will see that this neck becomes smaller and narrower and narrower and narrower. Stress keeps increasing a lot in this region. Eventually, the material snaps the material breaks, and that's at this point. We'll call that as point D, and that will be fracture, fracture point. So this is what steel experiences as we go beyond the elastic regions all the way to fracture point. Amazing, isn't it? And as told earlier, different materials will have very different experiences. And so what we'll do, the last thing we'll do, is we'll play with this graph a little bit more, Imagine we had another material which had the linear region somewhat like this. What could, we, what could we say about this material in comparison to steel? Well, notice that it has a lower slope now, but what does slope in this region tell us? Well, let's see. If we calculate the slope, if you draw a right angle triangle, then the slope is calculated as this side, which is the change in the stress, divided by this side, which is the change in strain. Now what do you get when you do change in stress divided by change in strain? Ooh, you end up with the Young's modulus. Can you see that? Therefore, slope, one way to think about slope is that it tells us how much the Young's modulus is, or it tells us how elastic that material is. So for example, if we said that aluminum, for example, aluminum had this graph, then you could easily say that, yeah, aluminum has a lower Young's modulus than steel. It is less elastic than steel. 
But another way to think about this slope is you can also say that, look, if you compare aluminum with steel, for the same strain, notice, for the same strain, a lower stress is needed for aluminum, right? And therefore, it's easier to stretch aluminum, it's easier to deform aluminum compared to steel. That's another thing that the slope tells us, how easy it is or how readily the material deforms under a given stress. Another important number is this, the ultimate tensile strength. For example, for steel, it turns out that that number is about half a gigapascal. But if you take something like, say, diamond, one of the strongest materials that is, this number is close to about 50 gigapascals. I mean, that's incredible. So diamond is incredibly strong. So this is also a number that's very useful for engineers to understand how strong a material is. One more interesting region is this one, the region in which the stress is pretty much a constant but the strain keeps increasing, the plastic flow region. If you take a material, a metal like say gold, then it turns out that it has an incredibly long region over here. It's pretty long. Uh, what does that tell us about gold, for example? What does it tell us? Well, that tells us that gold can be deformed a lot in this region before it hits fracture. In fact, it turns out that if you take a gram of gold, then you can stretch it up to about two and a half kilometers before you reach this point of fracture. So such materials which have very high plastic flow regions, where C and D point are very far apart, we call them as ductile materials. Very ductile, so gold is very ductile, Platinum also turns out to be extremely ductile. On the other hand, there are some materials which are exactly opposite of that, meaning they have a very narrow region of the plastic flow. In these regions, the point C and point D and point B all are very close to each other. And I'm not exaggerating over here, some materials are like this. We call them as brittle materials. I mean, think about it. Glass is one example over here. It's brittle because if you go a little bit beyond the elastic region, like you go beyond the elastic limit, then there's not much room left. Very quickly, the material will snap. Very quickly, it will break. And that's what glass does. Now, here's the mind-blowing thing. Whenever someone says the word brittle, what usually comes to my head is a picture of glass shattering, which makes me feel like brittle is the same as weak. But guess what? Brittle is not weak. Something can be extremely strong, having a very high tensile strength, but can be brittle at the same time. For example, diamond is brittle. Whenever someone says diamond is brittle, it sometimes confuses people. I should say, well, I thought diamond was our strongest thing, right? Well, guess what? Diamond is very strong. It has an extremely high tensile strength, but it's extremely brittle, as in you can't elongate it. So to put another way, diamond is very strong. It's extremely hard to break it, but you can't stretch it into thin wires. But I guess you already knew that.